Is this text a reference to another? Is she making critical commentary on another book? Let's talk about it today. The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't know. I might be running. This was <laughs> deep. And welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I would love to try speed walking crypto. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we have taken some of the most important literature that has influenced even today's writers, and we take a conversational approach to dissecting and understanding it. If you're down for a conversational approach to literature, hit that subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. Those Who Walked Away from Amalus was published in 1973. Now, Le Guin is a very prolific and popular writer that I have wanted to get onto this channel for quite some time, so I'm very excited to jump into this, one of her most popular popular short stories out there and it's for good reason too she has some of that sci-fi you know sff type approach to what she likes to write but brings in a lot of the literary elements that is really appropriate for this channel for us to kind of go through and talk about what does it mean to us as peoples I definitely got a kind of vonnegut vibe to it as well with her purpose and style of writing so what it the heck is Omelas? I had to look it up. A friend told me and kind of tipped me off. So I look up this interview by her, right? And she says she's driving down the road. And in the back, you know, the rear view of her car, she sees Salem, you know, Oregon, comma, O. And she just flips that. So Omelas is just Salem, comma, O backwards. <laughs> And it's interesting, too, because after I got done reading this, I was like, wow, this really reminds me of the Brothers K since we just read that. And it's interesting that she has come under some some fire, some criticism for saying, uh, you know, how does this relate to the Brothers K? It's very clear you're drawing influences from this. But uh, she's just like, Brothers Karamazov? Oh, I haven't read that in 20 years. I completely forgot about that book. <laughs> oh, come on. You can't completely forget about one of the most influential novels of all time. But I do love how... Uh, influence and inspiration can come out of nowhere for a creative mind like this. Well, and that concept of can you suffer for another person's sins? I don't know if I can really give that to just Brothers Karamazov. That's been around for a long, long time. But I know that is one of the most popular things to compare it to. Again, I would also even say for teachers, they love to use the lottery a lot of the times by Shirley Jackson to talk about utilitarianism. This is an amazing tool probably to have a similar conversation if you're looking to spice it up a little bit. Yeah, I think that you could take this and you know embed it into your classwork because this is something that goes along with all kinds of different culture and religions. The idea of someone taking on someone else's sin to try to alleviate pain in the world is a pretty commonplace throughout all of history history and in different cultures and religions. So let's go through the plot summary to make sure we're all on the same page real quick, and then we'll jump into some analysis and discussion. We are introduced to Omelas, a near-perfect city of unbelievable happiness, delight, and advanced technology and culture by an unnamed narrator. Hmm. Everyone is happy, and happy is held in the highest regard as to your goal in life. Now, Omelas has no kings. We don't need no swords. We don't need no priests. And we don't have any slaves either. Or at least that's what the narrator tells us. Next comes the flip or the linchpin, right? Everyone's happiness depends upon the suffering of one small child, one young little thing. Like they, don't say if, they don't say it's a boy, they don't say it's a girl, but this person, small child, is suffering. And not just like suffering, but like really suffering. Like lives in grime, lives in filth, lives in dirt, in despair, no hope. Okay, that it's it's a beautiful picture, right? No wonder it came from everyone thinks it compares it to no wonder everyone <laughs> compares it to a Dostoevsky novel, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty dark, groomy, pure misery, awfulness all rolled up in this story. Yeah. So once the Omela citizens are eight to twelve ish, they're shown the child. So even as a young person, you become aware that this person is suffering upon your behalf. So, so they're introduced, and they say there's no guilt in this town, but this narrator, maybe a little questionable on how reliable this narrator is. But that's kind of the presentation that we're given in this story. And a few citizens, young and old, silently agree, decide to walk away from the city. Right, And no one knows where they go. The story ends with, the place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible it does not exist, but they seem to know where they are going. The ones who walk away from Omelas. Powerful ending quote to this piece, I'll say that. 
Yeah, and you know me, I always get frustrated when there's like no closure, but I feel like that is the perfect closure for this story. And I did enjoy that she just kind of left it there of your own accord of, would you walk away or not? And that's one of the key questions, right? Right, it's because if you think about it, this is not a this is not a plot piece, right? We don't have a main character, a hero, you know, the antagonist. Well, who's causing the suffering? Well, we don't really have an antagonist either. Is the whole city is that what we're considering as the antagonist? This is literally meant to make you think and ask the question. And I think Le Guin does a really good job of kind of bringing up this individual versus society concept, or this bliss versus suffering, in a very compact, very story. All everything's crafted to lead towards this commentary of, well, I'm setting up the city to almost appear like it's going to be a utopian society, okay? But that's not where Le Guin wants to have this conversation. Yeah, not at all. She's totally heading down this path of this idea of, would you allow one person to suffer for the rest of society to almost experience pure bliss as long as... They were okay with the suffering of one for the greatness of the many. If they were okay with this, of completely ignoring it to be in their own happiness. Yeah, we're leaving this this dream of this utopia and are now kind of accepting the utilitarianism of what's the best for the most amount of people. Now, for those out there that don't know what what is the conversation of utilitarianism, Le Guin didn't invent this. It's an old ethical conundrum. How do you maximize the happiness of the most amount of people and well-being for all affected individuals? So that could mean that suffering for a small amount of people is necessary for a greater good. It doesn't mean everybody has to be happy. It doesn't mean everybody has to suffer. It means we're trying to minimize the displeasure, we're aiming towards happiness. There's a couple of different variations and, and ways to describing it, depending on which era, which century you're looking at utilitarianism. But here you see, okay, we've boiled down this society to have this like Tolkien-like introduction. We're building this amazing, perfect city with all this gloriness. And hey, man, you want an orgy? Hey, man, you want to do some drugs that aren't like, you know, habit-inducing? Like everything is on the table for happiness if it makes you happy in the city. But that child lives the most miserable and sufferable life that's ever happened right? We are accepting that some suckiness has to happen in the city. Yeah, I think this is a call to the the US and the world and this materialistic society that Le Guin is kind of seeing evolve throughout time. Because if we look at our own real life, real world, right, this kind of happens when you put on your shoes, your clothes, when you get your phone out, whatever materialistic stuff in your world you never think about the person that made that could be working in some terrible job, making very little money in unsafe working conditions. And those things really happen. And if you look back through time, if you look at the Industrial Revolution and you look at all these time periods where the progress of our societies and culture and everything is built off the backs of the hard work of people they are going to suffer for the elites to take advantage of that. And what Le Guin is doing here in this story is she's taking it to the extreme of saying, well, if you had a perfect society, a near perfect society, would you be willing to let this one child suffer? And I think a lot of us would, right? Because in this story, a lot of us do. And even in today, we don't have even close to the utopian-ish that she presents in this story, yet we do get up in the morning and have our coffee and grab our phones and enjoy our electricity and water, and we don't think about any of the people that might be suffering or having to work really hard for us to enjoy those, you know, accommodations of life. And so it's pretty deep and very thought-provoking, and again, I think that's kind of the whole thing of the story is there is no main character. It's just an idea to get you thinking about those that are helping you lead this wonderful life. And we got to be careful about what you said there, because I don't think you meant it, but you said it seemed to me like you implied materialism was the opposite of this, which I don't think necessarily these systems are related per se, but I could see how they interact with each other because just because you're materialistic doesn't mean you have to be a utilitarianist. Okay. Right. The, the utilitarian believes it's a, you know, you're trying to maximize happiness as opposed to the materialist. Well, not, I shouldn't say materialist, a person who has a materialism focused gains is looking to try to maximize the amount of things that they own or looking after coveted things, basically. But that doesn't necessarily have to come at the cost of others. But in the real world, to your point, it does a lot of times, right? 
And to me, Le Guin is writing more to that concept of how much are you allowing one person to suffer for another person's happiness? And I don't think just because you're materialistic that that is necessarily has to be the solution, but I think that's the way it, it tends to be a lot of times when it comes to the sweatshop examples and stuff like that that you've brought up. That was just what kind of popped into my head of an example. You could also do it, uh, the religious view, or you could do it, uh, you know, if you would have allowed one child to starve every year or even every day, but everybody else on the planet had all they could eat and more gluttonous amounts of food, would you allow it to happen? So it doesn't necessarily have to be materialistic possession, or it could be that there was world peace and everybody got along and agreed on everybody's religions, but there was one kid that had to suffer for that. Would you allow that to happen? Right. It doesn't have to be gluttony. It doesn't have to, they could just be happy. It's maximizing the pleasure or happiness in some views of it. What I like what Le Guin does here is, is we're complicit in the building of this world, right? The whole first half of this short story, we're like, oh man, this city sounds awesome. I want to live there, right? And then we get to that flip, and I like the way, it, it, you'll, you'll notice the way this flip happens. In the room, a child is sitting. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six, but actually is nearly ten. It is feeble-minded. Perhaps it was born defective, or perhaps it has become imbecile through fear, malnutrition, and neglect. It picks its nose and occasionally fumbles vaguely with its toes or genitals, as it sits hunched in the corner farthest from the bucket and the two mops. So one, very sad. <laughs> right? yeah. but, Sad's but, an understatement. <laughs> but, but you'll notice that she even attempts to dehuma dehumanize this this child with language, calling it it through this whole thing, not assigning pronouns to it so that we can kind of paint our own face onto this suffering thing. So not only were we complicit in wanting this perfect world and be like, this is great, this is definitely amazing, but then just like those kids that turn eight to 12, we enter into the room and are almost kind of forced to, to smash our face up against the suffering of this child so then no longer are we innocent with like, look, I just went to, to your earlier point, to the store and I bought this iPhone, right? Now I have to travel to China and I have to watch these people work, you know, 16, 18 hour days. I have to be aware of the suffering I'm causing before I can partake in the happiness or what I what would make me happy from a utilitarianist perspective, right? Yeah, that that's so true that... When it when it's in your face, it's going to be affecting you so much more. And it, it in the beginning of the story, it just feels so glamorous. And and until she pulls the curtain away and says, "Look!" and shoves it in your face, and you're like, "I don't want to," and she <laughs> peels your back eyelids up back. To that surface. <laughs> yeah, you just yeah, it, it it it's it's grating on your soul, your chi, your being, your conscience, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's kind of, you know, the the point of the story is that she wants it, you know, in your face and she wants to prove this point to you that you are either part of the problem, part of the solution, or you just walk away from it entirely. Do you notice too how she, like the language selection by Le Guin is pretty amazing too because it says, in the room, a child is sitting. That's a fact, Right. <laughs> yeah. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six, but actually is nearly 10. It's like, what are you doing, narrator? Like, do you know or do you not know? Right. And then it goes, it is feeble minded. Fact. Right. And then it goes into perhaps it was born defective or perhaps it's become more imbecile through fear, malnutrition, et cetera, et cetera. So even the narrator is very unreliable and is sometimes giving you fact. And sometimes giving you this uh, subjective opinion or or um, kind of almost like guessing at things, which I thought was kind of interesting too. So even if, to your point about the fact that Le Guin has structured this to be like, are you partaking or not partaking? Even the narrator is kind of wishy-washy too, where it's not like fact, 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 or hey, this could be this, don't you feel bad? The narrator is even kind of walking that line too of, well, how invested into this situation am I? How much am I revealing? Like the narrator isn't giving us the full details. And I wonder if that's to your point, kind of playing that line of am I in or not on this situation? I think it kind of brings back to what you said at the beginning of this is not a traditional story. I think it's all there to make, 
keep you off kilter. It's keep you off balance. Because if this was a traditional story and we gave that child a name and gave it an identity, we would either want a hero to come in and save it and try to mm-hmm. fix the situation, yeah. or we would want, is there a villain in here of some sort? We would need a narrative to continue this story in, in some progressive way of, oh, there's going to be a good guy that's going to come in and rally the troops and tear down this evil society that's going to make this one child suffer. Because you see it all the time. People are like, I would rather do X, Y, and Z than have one child suffer in our country. Like, they'll there there's this need to try to protect the innocent and i think that's why she has created this story with basically no narrative no people no nothing and it's so jagged to keep that sharp edge on just searing away at you as you go through this story to bring home that point of you got to make a choice in life uh, or you're just going to kind of bumble through it is in her view the narrator at one point says one thing i know there is none of in omelas is guilt. Did you believe the narrator out of curiosity that these people truly have no guilt for this child? No. That that's one thing that I didn't believe. I think that they are acceptance of their guilt. You're just like, you know, this is the way it is and the greater happiness outweighs the suffering of the few or the one and I will accept that guilt and live with it because as people we accept and live with a lot of guilt or regrets in life and we still get through it. Uh, I mean, I have regrets, but that doesn't mean I'm just going to throw away what I have now. Well, it's it's they're they're the people that are accepting the systems to your previous point too, right? That they will even potentially, in my opinion, they may even be lying to themselves about like, yeah, this is necessary. This child has to suffer in order for us to have all of this glorious lifestyle, like options and culture. And it kind of reminds me a little bit of that conversation from Brothers Karamazov where Ivan's like, look, for innocent children to suffer, he said that he would not partake in a religion that allowed the innocent children to suffer if they had the power to stop it. He would return his ticket to heaven in in the, in the famous chapter Rebellion of the Brothers Karamazov, right? And this is Le Guin's same story where if I have to let a little innocent child suffer, which I which I, if you don't think is necessary— Okay, you're not buying into the utilitarian experiment here, thought experiment, if you will. You walk away. You don't know where you're going, but you seem to be aware. But, you know, the narrator or people of the city are like, well, why would you leave all this happiness? And it's, be- it's because you can't accept the, the, the exchange, right? This, this is not my ideology. And uh, that, I think that's kind of one of the interesting things about this story is how well it parallels that conversation of can you allow this innocent child to suffer for your... You know, in, in religion, we talk about sin, but here they're suffering for your happiness. I would argue against the narrator that the only place that there is no guilt is with the ones that walk away outside of the, the city. Because they're the ones that have, have given it up and saying, I'm not going to partake in this no matter what. It's not worth it to me. I'm going to leave. And the uncertainty is better than partaking in something that is going to forcefully have a child suffer. And it's interesting to compare it to the lottery too, like that that idea of pretending we don't have guilt. So in that story, if you recall, they were fine with the experiment, like what happened in that town, the lottery by Shirley Jackson. And it was only once they got selected to be on the suffering side that they're like, no, this isn't fair. Like and they start trying you to You didn't throw give it. me time to pick. We yeah. got to redo it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Right. It's that idea that you will force yourself to think a certain way to backwards rationalize or justify your ends for your happiness, even though you know that it is specifically causing suffering. Now, whether that's wrong or not, is another thing. But you will backwards rationalize and justify your actions actions just so that you don't have to feel the suffering so you don't have to witness the fact that you are causing harm upon other people is one of the ways that i could take that oh i got something for you it doesn't come in the story but it brings up a good thought-provoking discussion that again teachers could have with their students that kind of along the lines of the lottery is how is that child chosen Mm -hmm. If, if it is your child that's picked would you stay living in that city knowing that you and the rest of your family is happy, but that one child is down below in this horrible situation? Or you'd be like, you know what? You pick my kid. I'm out. Right. I'm out. 
Right. And and that's the Tessie conversation from the lottery, right? You're in yeah. as long as you're not the one suffering. And that's when you quickly realize, yeah, I don't I'm not a utilitarianist. <laughs> <laughs> I I am not okay with the system. <laughs> or are you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, well, I think some people are like, well, okay, if it's better for everyone else, I'll do it, right? Like that. Or or it is only when it's in your face because when the kids locked away down under the city and you know about it, but it's out of sight, out of mind. It isn't in your face. Maybe you are more more accepting of that. Yeah, and I think that's what the story to me helps bring out is that question of like, well, is it worth it? And do I think that's a valid, you know, system? And I think that's where the discussion exists with this story because I think Le Guin does a good enough job of staying. I, I kind of have a strong feeling of how she actually feels, <laughs> but she does a good enough job of staying neutral on this topic to allow that conversation to happen, which is why, which is where her literature side comes out, right? Like this is her literature side saying, I'm not offering a solution. I'm not telling you what the answer is. I kind of, I think she's got an opinion, but I think she's letting the reader kind of come out to the forefront with what does this tell about me and what my values are? think she'd be walking away i think she would too of course she would yeah <laughs> i would hope i would i, I hope i would i hope I, I was a strong enough person so i think a good first pick for us to have chosen the Le Guin score story to kind of discuss and i'm looking forward to more talks from her we'll put a playlist down below so if you're coming to this years later we'll hopefully have had more Le Guin talks up by the time you get to this in the meantime, crypto, let's move into our subjective ratings which shouldn't mean anything from an objective quality of the story just how did it hit you it hit me pretty hard. Uh, this one, I, I kind of had to go through twice uh, to really understand and pick up some of those vibes of what was going on in this not utopian society and why it was. And I had to reflect back a lot on myself. So I'm going to give this one a solid 7.5. I think it's a really good read. I think that it there's so many parallels that you can draw with Brothers K and with the lottery and this idea of the one versus the few it fits nicely in there. It can add more discussion and give that idea without all of the story and all of the, the characters. Nice little bite-sized piece. Very good story. Worth reading. Yeah, I can definitely see how you would, you know, as a teacher, you'd want to thrust this into your syllabus just because, you know, that you'd, you, see, you see the lottery, you see Brothers Karamazov used a lot. It's great to have other stories in the... Um, the rotation, if you will. So I, I think I would give this probably like a seven or eight. I'll, I tell you what, I'll go the same score, 7.5. How about that? Um, nice. It's one of those ones that depending to on your background of how many conversations you've had to this, I think this is actually probably the clearest depiction that we've had about this conversation. And I think it's the most interesting with the way that, you know, it presents facts for subjective opinions. And do you accept the situation or walk away? This is probably the clearest I've seen writing on it. Um, maybe just a victim of our own. This is again a commentary on me, not on the story. It doesn't go too deep that if you've had enough conversations on the story, that it doesn't push me further th than we have in the past. I think, but uh, definitely one like if this was introduced first, I, I could see this being like whoa, like mind blowing to someone who's never had this conversation before. A nice ladder piece, right? So you start off with the the ones who walk away from Oilalis, then you move into lottery, and then you could hit, you know, Brothers K. Maybe a few other steps in there or wrongs on the ladder, but it, it would be a nice base to get young readers into this very depth of discussion. Yeah. It's it's the easiest concept to grasp, I think. I, I think this is the clearest clearest for this situation. So guys, yeah, like if that. you're down for a conversational approach to literature like we did today, Hit that subscribe button as we post videos every Monday and Thursday. We'd love to have you along. Let us know in the comments down below what you guys thought. Would you stay in the city or would you walk away? Una out. Peace. <laughs>